Peter King, kind enough to join us. Pete's on the road. He is, uh, was uh, in San Francisco. He was there with the Lions and the Niners, and uh, you stayed there. Are you? Uh, it's uh, it's early out there, Pete. Uh, it's dark out it's there. Early, Pete. Yeah. Uh, where are you? Yeah, I'm on my way to I'm on my way to do a story out here uh, with the 49ers before I come back home to New York. And the only way I could do it, unfortunately, is by doing something very early this morning. And then I realized when the great Todd Fritz asked me to be on the show, I said, this is going to be dark out here where I am. So anyway, sorry about this weirdo, uh, you know, this weirdo look this morning, Dan. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Glad to have you. (laughs) Glad to have you there. Uh, can you tell us what you're doing with the 49ers? I really can't, but it's not any deep, dark secret. I just am not going to say anything until the column comes out next week. Okay. Uh, what was your takeaway from the Lions' perspective a few days you know, removed from it? Well, I, I kind of split the baby on this, Dan. I think that Dan Campbell was fine in going for it on fourth and two on his first series in the third quarter for a very simple reason that they had obliterated the San Francisco defense in the first half and they were playing great. And on this particular drive, they had taken it down the field, 47 yards. The 49ers as of yet had not stopped them. And so it's fourth and two. And you say, Hey, we could be ahead 31 to 10. Let's do it. Let's go for it. So I don't have a problem with that. Because remember, I mean, the reason why we're all talking about this, honestly, is is in large part because of Jameer Gibbs' fumble. You know, basically right after the 49ers score to make it 24-17. The second one I have a real problem with. Because you're down with seven minutes and 36 seconds to go, 27-24. You have a 48-yard field goal. And, Dan, when I meet, when I tell you that being in that stadium that, that day, that night, it was an absolutely beautiful day, and the weather was zero factor. At the time of that kick, it was probably 65 degrees, maybe, you know, no wind. And, you know, so I don't know. A, a field goal kicker should be able to make a 48-yard field goal, especially, especially – when you consider that if you're the Lions, you have to think to yourself, we're only going to get the ball one more time. That's it. We got to tie this game. And then we, our defense has got to make a stop. So that's how I look at those two things. You've been in so many locker rooms uh, over the year. Like I have secondhand pain for the Lions. I'm not invested in the Lions, yeah. but I feel I feel for that fan base and Dan Campbell and everybody because they may not get back here. Can you remember going into a locker room that had sort of a similar feel? Well, the unfortunate thing is I didn't go into the Detroit locker room uh, after the game, Uh, but obviously there was devastation in there. Um, And, and look, I, I think the one game that I thought of that, the 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 two teams were just like distraught or the team was distraught after the game was the Giants when they lost to the Bears in Chicago on the Sean Landetta whiffed punt. Now you got to be a person of a certain age to understand that and to remember it, right, Dan? But I think honestly, if you remember that moment, you remember going into that locker room after the game that the New York Giants would be fried, and they were. Talking to Peter King, he's uh, joining us somewhere in the Bay Area and uh, <laughs> by candlelight here. It's a, it's like the Blair Witch Project, uh, Peter. Where... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should have thought of that. It's a great one, Dan. I should have thought of that. The Ravens' loss, it feels like, is being overshadowed by the Lions. Should it be? Man, that was a bad game for the Baltimore Ravens. It was a bad game in so many ways. How many veteran guys on the Ravens made absolutely stupid plays? And look, you know, you're competing out there, and I understand it, but Kyle Van Noy is 32 years old. He's one of the smartest guys 
you know, on on that on that team, and he headbutts Travis Kelsey. I mean, how foolish is that? Roquan Smith, the defensive leader of that team, twenty million dollar a year man, you know, the the centerpiece of that defense. This generation's Ray Lewis. He's not as good, but that's what he's asked to do. And he not only jumps offside, which would be understandable, but he plows over a guy and gets a fifteen yard penalty. I mean. Those things are just not possible, not tolerable. And that's what would really bother me. And, and look, Lamar Jackson's throwing into triple coverage. And again, I'm not in any way dismissing that. Horrible decision. <laughs> but he's trying to make a play, you know, when nothing is going right for his team. But overall, this is another... Uh, mark in the column of Lamar Jackson's not very good in the playoffs. He has had one great half in six playoff games. That's just not good. And and I know everybody will have different reasons for it and all that stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, Dan, he's been overall a lousy playoff quarterback. And that can't be erased by two MVPs. If I would have told you 30 years ago, Vegas would hold the Super Bowl. What would oh. you have said? Hey, if you had told me 20 years ago, eight years ago, <laughs> I would have said, you're out of your mind. It'll never happen. But the NFL got in bed with the gambling interests. Everybody's in bed with the gambling interests now. Everybody. It's not just the NFL. And it's not just every sports league. It's every media company now. Yeah. So uh, what do you what do you expect? Honestly. What do you expect? The NFL is going to play a Super Bowl in Las Vegas. It's totally insane to think about it. But again, that's the way our country is going right now. Yeah, I I just worry because, you know, Commissioner Goodell was anti-gambling in 2015. And I don't he was. I don't know if anything changed other than they realized what their piece of the pie was going to be. And these other leagues realized their piece of the pie and what it was going to be. Dan, honestly, it's the one the one reason why you can't blame the leagues, quite honestly. The one reason is very simple, is that the the legal system in our country, the judicial system in our country said gambling's fine. Go ahead. All you states, you make your own rules on gambling now. You make your own laws. It's up to you. And so now we have uh, legalized sports gambling in how many states in the country? I don't know, at least 20. And so, you know, that is what happened. Mm -hmm. But the NFL uh, not only, uh, you know, embraced gambling, it's gotten full on into bed with gambling. And if, if you can make money on it, the NFL sniffs it out and figures it out. I want you to place Bill Belichick in a media job. Where would it be? What would he do? I mean, Rich Eisen had the best take when I talked to him the other day. It was it, it, He said, how about a coach cast with Nick Saban, where they go and stream on uh, whatever, either Fox or, or Paramount Plus or Peacock or maybe even Amazon Prime. You know, they, they they figure out a way for Belichick and Saban to work together. Very light lifting. And Belichick could sort of change the narrative on who he is and what a dour, you know, sour, uh, antagonistic human being he is. I think he needs to do that because, look, if you're going to hire a coach next hiring cycle, and understand that when Bill Belichick takes the sideline for your team, he's going to be 73 years and five months old. Well, you better think that you're hiring a guy who you can get along with. Because at the end, the Crafts really didn't get along with Bill Belichick. And, and so he's got to change the narrative on who he is. Yeah, I'm wondering, you'd have to have a, a strong host with <laughs> Saban and Belichick because they'd have to kind of get yeah. you in and out of segments there. It couldn't be like the Mannings, but I could see where those two guys and their friends have them, uh, you know, dish on games. Um, 
But also, I was wondering, here was one we were talking about. You know, Greg Olson has done a really good job with Fox this year. Yeah, I'm excellent. Okay, why, why don't, can you monetize Brady in the studio more than you can with him just being at a game? I don't know that, Dan. I'm a little dubious about that because, you know, if you were one of six people in a studio, is that worth for an hour of a pregame show and some of a postgame show? Is that worth the same as when 56 million people are watching your game and watching you? I don't know what the ratings are for the pregame shows, mm -hmm. but let's say it's, what is it? I don't know, eight or 10 million. I don't even know, but it's not huge because there are so many of them. And so the fact is, I think it'd be hard to monetize that if I were Fox. I wonder if you could put Brady in with Olsen and maybe do a little uh, hybrid, a little combo platter there. Maybe, you know, the three-man booth, though, is a totally different animal. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe Fox will decide to do it. But <laughs> I think what happens then is you have the guy who's making, what did he make this year, $10 million? I don't even know. Uh, what, 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 I, I shouldn't even say, what did he make, $10 million? I don't know what he made. Mm -hmm. But Brady, obviously, is making whatever it is, $37 million. And it would kind of seem absurd that the guy who everybody right now thinks is one of the best or the best making a quarter of what the big star is making yeah. and outshining him in the booth. It would just seem pretty weird to me. Yeah, I, I wonder. We have Greg Olson on the show tomorrow, but um, I thought that he did a you know really really good job in simplifying the game and i thought he had a really good yeah. performance over the weekend and we were just wondering if you put brady in the studio let's say fox's studio there uh people want to see tom brady it's not i don't know if it's necessarily want to hear him but see him in the studio we'll find out yeah we'll find out and dan i think the other thing is i don't know who actually pays who looks at a game and says I'm going to watch this. I'm more eager to watch this because I love the analyst of the game. I, I mean, maybe some people did that with John Madden. I don't know. But I tend to think that the vast, vast, vast majority are going to tune in if Bozo the Clown is the analyst <laughs> on the game. Well, I'm wondering about that, too. If you got 56 million that watch the game, it's... You know, does Tom Brady bring more to that? Or if I put him in the studio, you're going to watch the pregame, maybe more, and then you'll stay tuned for halftime, and then you'll stay tuned for the postgame as well. Like, that would be something that I think you could say Brady is getting an audience, maybe. keeping an audience, more than, you know, who's broadcasting the game. Maybe, but just, Dan, imagine – if you were Fox right now and you go to Tom Brady and say, Hey, I know you've been working for the last six months and doing a lot of practice broadcasts and you've been going around the country and meeting with different people and really honing your craft when you become a, an analyst at a game site. And imagine Fox goes to him now and said, uh, we want you to be in the studio. <laughs> if I'm Brady, I'm saying a, no, B, you guys still got to pay me what I'm worth because this is not what you hired me to do. What would a Super Bowl win mean for Patrick Mahomes? <clears throat> I mean, he's already had an absurd career. He's already had the kind of career that one third of the way through it, that I'm pretty sure he'd make the Pro Football Hall of Fame if, uh, you know, two weeks from now, he never stepped on a football field again. But what what it would mean is it would accelerate his process in winning a third Super Bowl to basically competing with Tom Brady uh, to be the best ever. Because clearly, if you win a third Super Bowl in your first six years, that's an absurd start to your career. 
And again, look, Brady had sort of two careers. He had that first half, you know, when he won three Super Bowls, then he had a drought and then he won three more. So I, I don't know what it would do other than to just sort of put an exclamation point on what everybody already thinks of him, which is that he's got a very good chance of going down as the best of all time. What would a Super Bowl do for Brock Purdy? He's already an incredible story. And I think if he wins this game, I mean, maybe, possibly, could be, you know, we'll shut up all the people who think the 49ers are winning in spite of Brock Purdy, which is so ridiculously insane. You know, and I hate the whole analytics element that that basically gives that breath. Because a guy who's the quarterback of a winning football team, you can't make excuses for that. He has a lot to do with it. He doesn't have everything to do with it. And he has an incredible supporting cast. But let me ask you this question. How great is Jared Goff's supporting cast? It's probably the best supporting cast of any quarterback in football. And yet everybody talks about, oh, man, Goff is really taking his game to the next level. (laughs) I mean, at some point you're going to have to. And again, look, Brock Purdy's had his hiccups this year. There's no question about it. But, you know, every quarterback does. And I just think the second half he played in that game and how he's played overall in his first, whatever, 25, 28 games in the NFL, it really should be enough for people now. But for some, it isn't. Great to talk to you, Pete. Thanks for joining us and uh, safe travels back. Thanks so much, Dan. Appreciate it. That's Peter King on the road doing something secretive. What could it be? What could it be for Peter? We're going to find out next Monday the Football Morning in America column.